So I want to, uh, to talk about water waves, which are waves that propagate on the free surface of a fluid. You might think of a lake, a river, ocean, whatever. They are generated by wind action, earthquake, underwater volcanic eruption, many different ways. And they have been studied since many centuries, going back to Laplace, Lagrange, Poisson, Cauchy, two centuries ago, or Eri, Boussinesque, and Storks, slightly after. Them. I am going to discuss a point of view that have been introduced in 1968 by Vladimir Zakharov, which we will see is a way to study various properties of water wave in Eulerian coordinates. Today I am going to discuss only elementary identities and introduce the equation. We are going to work with rectangular coordinates. They are x1, x2, and y. x2, x1, and y. x1 and x2 are the horizontal coordinate, and y is the vertical coordinate. And to determine vertical coordinate, because we are taking into account gravity. We are going to study a time-dependent fluid domain, omega of t. It's time-dependent. And at a given time t, it is of the form of the set of point x and y in R2 times R, such that y is strictly smaller than some function eta of tx. There are many variants which are possible that we are not going to discuss the case with the bottom that will be discussed next week by David Lan, I presume. We could also consider the case where the free surface is not a graph. And there are, of course, obviously, many possible variants. So for us, the situation is this one. We consider the simplest case. We have a fluid domain. This is the half space omega of t, located under this graph, which is a graph of a function, function e. So these are the main notations. Later, when we consider a function f of the variable t, x, and y, I will always use this notation, f restricted to y equal eta, as a short notation for the function that map tx to f of tx and eta of x. The notation nabla always refers to the derivative with respect to x. OK? which is dx1, dx2. When we consider the full gradient, we write in this way. Similarly, I will denote by the Laplacian, the Laplacian with respect to x. And the full Laplacian is this one. Now, for our problem, the n noun will be firstly the function eta itself is an unknown of the problem. We say 
that sigma is a free surface because eta is an unknown that has to be determined. This is a free surface elevation. We will also consider the fluid velocity u, the fluid pressure. They are related by the incompressible Euler equation that has been introduced this morning. This is the equation dTU plus u dot the gradient of u plus the gradient of P plus GY is equal to zero together with the incompressibility conditions that the divergence of U is equal to zero. So this is in omega, in omega. And we also add the restriction, the condition that U goes to zero at minus infinity. No, no fluid velocity at minus infinity. So the classical impressible Euler equation. We do not take into account the viscosity. We have two boundary condition, conditions on the free surface. The first is the balance of force, of forces. We neglect surface tension to simplify notation, and we assume that the jump of pressure is equal to zero. The pressure is continuous at the free surface. In addition, we assume that, okay, here, let's say, just to think about the problem, that this is the air and this is water. We assume that the pressure of the air is constant. This is part of the way of the modelization. And the value of this constant is irrelevant. You can always add or subtract a constant. It does not change the physics. So we assume that it is equal to zero by convention without loss of generality. So the fact that the jump of pressure is zero and that the pressure of the air is zero just means that with this notation, that the pressure of the fluid, when evaluated at the free surface, is equal to zero. The second boundary condition is called kinematic boundary condition. One way to express it is to write that capital V index N is equal to U dot N. So to explain the notation here, firstly, at a point, let's consider a point, capital X of T. Let's consider a point on the free surface. Here, you have a vector, the normal vector, unit normal vector pointing towards the air, which is this vector, 1 upon the square root of 1 plus gradient eta squared this is a normal vector at the point x of t of the free surface what is so this is for this notation u is a fluid velocity this is a normal this is a scalar vector in r3 and the notation V index N refer to dx over dt dot N. Okay, you differentiate with respect to time. 
So it gives you the vector 0 dt of eta. You take the scalar product with gradient of eta, but this is 0. Scalar product with gradient of eta, it vanishes. It remains only the contribution of this coordinate, dt of eta, times 1, divided by the square root of 1 plus gradient eta square. So this is dt of eta divided by 1 plus gradient eta square. In particular, this boundary condition simplifies to, it is customary to write it as a time evolution, uh, an equation for the evolution in time of dt of eta. So we just multiply both sides by this factor, and we prefer to write the equation in this form. Now, there are two corollaries that can be worked out from this condition to understand its meaning. First, just a bit of notation. Capital U will be U evaluated on Y equal eta. With this notation, we have that okay, you have this factor here that simplify with this factor there. So it remains only dt of eta is equal to capital U index 3 minus u1 dx1 of eta minus u2 dx2 of eta. One way to understand the meaning of this equation in terms of physics is to introduce the notion of fluid particles that was introduced this morning. A fluid particle is a curve. This is a curve, a function depending on time satisfying this ordinary differential equation. So there is this result. Any fluid particle which is initially on sigma of zero remains on sigma for all time. So if you have a fluid particle that is on the free surface, it remains on the free surface. Okay? And the proof is, is really elementary. It's a direct consequences of this. A second proposition is the results that was already mentioned this morning. Consider a function f depending on t, x, and y. Then we have this result. d over dt of the integral over the fluid domain of f of t, x, and y, dy, dx, is equal to the integral of omega of t of dt f plus u dot gradient f will prove this proposition because there is 
system computation that are widely used to study waterways. OK, so we have the fluid domain. Uh, just uh, to explain the notation, it's convenient to integrate first in, you, you can exchange the order of integration, of course, but it's convenient to think that you integrate first in y and then in x. OK, for the proof. The proof is really elementary. Eh? The integral over the fluid domain of f is, by definition, the integral. First, you integrate in y, then you integrate in x. Then you want to differentiate with respect to time. So either you differentiate f, or you differentiate eta there. This is equal to, so you have this factor. And then you have an equation for dt of eta. This is written there. This is u dot n, f. Everything is evaluated on y equal eta. And then you have this factor, square root of 1 plus gradient eta squared dx. This factor here, you, are, you have the free surface there. So you have Pythagoras theorem that tells you that this is equal to, OK, excuse me. Here it's integral over R2. I can rewrite this as the integral over the free surface, which is the boundary of omega f u dot n d sigma. OK? Because the surface element here is equal to this by Pythagoras theorem. Then you have Stokes theorem that allow you to write this at the divergence of the vector field f times u. And then you conclude the proof by recalling that the divergence of u is equal to 0. This is a computation, an elementary result that is very useful whenever you want to compute the time derivative of global quantities. In this course, we are going to discuss various different, di two different kinds of proof. Proof which rely on global quantities and proof which rely on local or micro-local quantities. Main global quantities are the three following ones. A function E index K of T, which is one half of the integral over omega of U squared. 
more precisely, the square of the Euclidean norm of u dy dx. A quantity E index P of T, which is G divided by 2, the integral of R2 of eta of T x squared dx, and a function E of T, which is the sum of the two previous quantities. Of course, the first is the kinetic energy. The second is the potential energy. And the third is the total energy. Why the square of the potential energy? Because the potential you, you have to integrate. It's a domain with infinite depths. But let's say you are integrated, integrating on a domain with finite depths. Then you will integrate from minus h to eta of y. And you get eta squared. In infinite depths, you cannot integrate. OK. So you have the kinetic potential and total energy. And observe that they are quadratic quantities. Of course, there is this result that the total energy is preserved. It's, of course, a well-known fact. And its proof is the consequences of the previous proposition. I am not going to prove this result because we are later going to prove a stronger result, which is, in fact, the first observation made by Vladimir Zakharov in 1966 or 1968. And it, this is the first paper, I think, of Vladimir Zakharov. It contains, it's a very short paper, which contains several ideas. And in particular, the first one is that the conservation of energy is associated to Hamiltonian structure. To explain this result, we are going to follow the point of view introduced later by Walter Craig and Catherine Sulem. This is in 1997, which was further developed by David Lahn starting in 2005. We are going to consider an irrotational flow. So from now on, hereafter, we make the running assumption that the curl of u is equal to 0. It is not necessary to do it. Many variants are possible, and I refer for the general case to Castro and Lan, their GFM paper. So we have a, a velocity field that is irrotational. Then we can write there exists a function phi defined in the fluid domain omega with scalar value called velocity potential. Okay. 
there exists a velocity potential such that u is equal to the gradient of phi. I'm going to stay close to the window. So phi, we are going first to rewrite the equation in terms of phi. Firstly, the incompressible Euler equation. In fact, there are several equations. Firstly, the equation for DTU. The equation for DTU implies that phi satisfies the Bernoulli equation. Again, there should be a constant, but we assume that this constant is zero. This is the Bernoulli equation. A fundamental fact is that the fact that u is incompressible, divergence of u equals zero, implies that the divergence of the gradient is zero. In other words, phi is an harmonic function. This is essential. Phi is harmonic. The boundary condition that u vanishes at minus infinity can be rephrased as follow. We also have that recall p vanishes on the free surface. And eventually, the equation for eta can be written in this form. dt of eta is equal to the third component of u, which is dy phi, minus gradient of eta dot gradient phi evaluated on y equal eta. So this is an obvious way to rewrite the water wave equation once you assume that they are irrotational. Is it a natural assumption to make? It does not seem natural if you are used to the classical incompressible Euler equation. But let's imagine that you have a wave tank made of full of water at the free surface is flat and you don't have velocity. And let's say you are going to make wave tank in motion as you want. For example, you can blow not like the wind, the width is a sheer stress. Here you blow from above. You are going to generate a wave, for sure. And you generate a wave in a way which is conservative. So you don't introduce any vorticity. And since the equation is initially irrotational, because it is, it will remain irrotational forever. So it is perfectly legitimate to make this assumption. It just means that Initially, you were at rest, and you have generated your wave by something which is conservative. Okay? So to rewrite the water wave equation in this form is quite natural. What Zakharov did is something different. There is this observation that, of course, since phi is an harmonic function, and you have natural boundary condition at the bottom, Phi is fully determined by its trace on the free surface, as every harmonic function or any harmonic function are de is determined by its trace. So Zakharov introduced the function psi of Tx, which is phi evaluated on the free surface.
Très bien, Sulem. Introduce the use of the Dirichlet to Neumann operator. Not the Dirichlet to Neumann operator, but the use of the Dirichlet to Neumann operator in this problem. I recall the definition of this operator, which is a classical operator in analysis. Assume to begin that eta and psi are two functions of the, <coughs> the variable x, which are smooth. What does it mean? Let's say they belong to the space h infinity of R2 of this function, which are smooth, the infinity, and whose all derivative which belong together with all their derivatives to the space L2. Then it is classical that there exists a unique function phi in some function space, which is the harmonic extension of psi. Namely, a unique function phi. We will clarify this in the second lecture tomorrow. Laplacian of phi is zero in the domain eta smaller than y smaller than eta. Phi coincide with psi on the free surface and converges to zero when y goes to minus infinity. This is classical. Then, the Dirichlet to Neumann operator, denoted by g of eta. The notation introduced by Walter Craig is defined by g of eta psi is equal to square root of 1 plus gradient eta squared dn phi evaluated on y equals e. Okay. So dn means the normal derivative. And as we have already seen here, there is this coefficient there that cancel with the factor here. So if you prefer, you can also write this in this way. G of eta psi is equal to dy phi minus gradient of eta dot gradient phi evaluated on y equals eta. So these operators appear in many in analysis. For example, he plays a key role in the study of the problem that Calderon introduced, the so-called Calderon problem. Okay. I forgot to mention that 
there are many other approaches that exist to study water waves. We are following the approach introduced by Zakhar, but there are also some Lagrangian approaches that have been developed, for instance, by Christodoulou and Lindat, Kouta and Scholar, Ambrose Masmoudi, Shata and Zhang, Kukavicha and Tufar, De Poiferre, and many others. We are not going to discuss any of these approaches, and we are not going to discuss also approaches based on geometry. In fact, you will see that we will make an essential use of this quantity, which are everything geometrical, the vertical and the horizontal derivative, and it's convenient to have two notations. B, we denote by B, the evaluation of the vertical component of the velocity on the free surface, capital B. Capital V, this is the evaluation of the horizontal component of the velocity on the free surface. And then there is a lemma, which is very useful when you handle the equation that relates these quantities. We have four identities. Firstly, we can express B and V in terms of eta and psi only. B is B is this one, G of eta psi plus gradient eta dot gradient psi, scalar product in R2, divided by 1 plus gradient eta squared. Second identity, V is equal to gradient psi minus B gradient of eta. The third identity is more interesting. It has to do with the fact that for an harmonic function, the tangential and normal derivatives on the free surface are related. OK, this is an equation inside the domain for the derivative that has a counterpart on the free surface this identity, g of eta b, is equal to minus the divergence of v. And eventually, a very important formula, which is Lance shape derivative formula. There are several ways to, to write it. One way is this one. You differentiate this. How do you differentiate this quantity, g of eta? Firstly, the easy part is to differentiate with respect to psi, because here we are solving a problem which is linear with respect to psi. So g of eta is an operator linear with respect to psi. With respect to eta, this is much more difficult because when you vary eta, you vary phi in a delicate way. But still, there is an identity, this one, divergence of v. Okay. If you don't like, if you don't like uh, the use of this symbol, you can rewrite it in this way. Let's say we can rewrite it as follow. 
let's say we want to differentiate this quantity in the direction of eta dot. It means that we are computing the limit when epsilon goes to 0 of 1 upon epsilon g of eta plus epsilon eta dot psi minus g of eta psi. Okay? The usual finite difference operator. Anyway, so this result asserts that this is equal to minus g of eta b times eta dot minus the divergence of v eta dot. So the proof of the first two points are elementary. Okay? We have four identities. I start by proving the second one. To do so, we compute what is the gradient of psi. This is the gradient of phi of x, eta of x which is the gradient of phi plus the derivative with respect to y. And this is, this is capital V by notation plus capital B by notation gradient eta. And of course, this is equivalent to the second identity. To prove the first identity, it suffices to rewrite that by definition. This is equal to, you see, this is written here. G of eta psi is equal to, this is capital B minus gradient eta dot gradient V. Now, we use the second identity to replace capital V by gradient psi minus B gradient of eta dot gradient of eta. And we simplify to get 1 plus gradient eta squared B minus gradient psi gradient of eta which is, of course, equivalent to the first identity. For the point number three and four, there is um, like a trick that can be used which is every time you are able to identify a new harmonic function, you are able to get a new identity. To be more specific, we prove the identity three by noting that phi is an harmonic function. So,
the derivative of phi with respect to y is also an harmonic function. And we will see tomorrow, for instance, or oh, it's, uh, it's easy to see, that the derivative of dy phi are also converging to 0 at minus infinity. In particular, dy phi is the harmonic extension of its trace okay dy is an harmonic function and in particular it is the harmonic extension of its trace on the free surface so we can compute by the definition of g of eta we can compute what is g of eta of b. This is dy of dy phi minus the gradient of eta dot gradient of dy phi and you evaluate everything on the free surface. Now this term here can be expressed as minus the divergence with respect to x of phi. Laplacian with respect to x of phi. So just by using the chain rule, we see that the quantity here is the divergence of gradient of phi evaluated on the free surface, which is equal to minus the divergence of V by definition of capital V. So this proves the third identity. And for the fourth uh, identity, fourth one, what, what we do? We have a function, free surface elevation, eta epsilon. We have a trace. We'd, we get a function, phi epsilon, which is the harmonic extension of psi in the domain located under the graph of this function. This is an harmonic function. Then you get a new harmonic function by differentiating with respect to epsilon. You have a new harmonic function, so you have a new identity, which turns out to be Lanz shape derivative formula. So concerning this idea that every time you have a new harmonic function, you have a new identity, uh, for example, when you are in 2D, when you are in 2D and phi is an harmonic function, this one is also harmonic. Okay, so there are ways to generate new harmonic function once you have one. Okay, so now we can state the result. The so-called X Philem Zakharov formulation. Of the water wave problem. This is a reduction, a full reduction to the boundary. a 
a fluid problem in a fluid domain, and you extract from it a problem which is equivalent and involving only function defined on the boundary. This is this formulation. DT of theta is equal to G of eta psi. DT of psi plus G of eta plus capital N of eta and psi is equal to zero. Where N <coughs> is equal to this term. First fact, A, B, or maybe A, B, the energy itself can be written in terms of eta and psi. The energy G over 2 times eta squared dx plus 1 half of psi times G of eta psi dx. dt of eta is in, in, in fact equal to the variation of the energy with respect to psi and dt psi is equal to minus the variation of the energy with respect to eta. So this formulation is beautiful because it's a Hamiltonian formulation. It's beautiful because it involves a pseudo-differential operator, so it's related to the work of Calderon. It's very convenient because here the function eta psi are function of t and x. So it's very classical. It's very easy to introduce functional space. Before, we were working with functions defined on a domain which depend on time. So even the meaning of this equation is not crystal clear. But here, the meaning is crystal clear. OK? And it's also very interesting because it, it is used by people doing only pure mathematics, numerics, physics. Physicians are using this a lot and to study very different kind of problems. So the proof for A, the equation A, dt of eta is equal to g of eta psi. This is by the very definition of g of eta psi. There is nothing to prove. For B, This is elementary. This is the chain rule. Similar to the computation we have already done. For the point C, the fact that the energy can be expressed in terms of eta and psi, this is Stokes theorem again, indeed. We have to look at what is the kinetic energy. This is equal to the integral of gradient phi squared. But this is equal to, you can write it in this way.
the divergence of phi greater than phi because phi is harmonic. And Stokes' theorem tells you that this is equal to the integral over the free surface of phi dn phi d sigma. But the normalization factor, square root of uh, 1 plus gradient theta squared, has the effect that this is equal to the integral over R2 of phi evaluated on the free surface. This is psi, and this is g of eta psi dx. So it remains to prove the point uh, D and E. Okay. You can use Stokes' theorem in another way to prove that if you have two functions f and g, you want to compute the integral of f g of eta g. using obvious notation for the harmonic extension of the function small f and small g, denoted by capital F and capital G. Of this, no, voilà. which is the divergence of f gradient g, which is because capital G is harmonic, this is gradient f dot gradient g. And you can, of course, you have a result which is symmetric with respect to capital F and capital G. So in particular, the initial result has to be symmetric with respect to small f and small g. And you get that g theta is self-adjoint for the L2 scalar product. Then... When you look at the variation of this quantity with respect to psi, you get which is exactly the statement of the point D. Okay? Once you know that it is symmetric, you have it. For the point E, this is more difficult. This is where we use David Lang shape derivative formula. We want to, to see how this varies when we vary eta. So what do we have? Uh, the term which are linear in epsilon are okay, and they are error term. Okay, and here we proceed to integrate by part. G of eta is self-adjoint as we have seen. So this is minus G of eta psi, G of eta times B, times eta dot dx. And here we integrate by parts. We have plus capital V gradient 
of psi times eta dot. So it means that the variation of the kinetic energy with respect to eta is exactly this function. And this is equal to exactly n, the nonlinear term. It's a small verification, a small computation to verify using the formula for b and for v that we have that this is capital N. So we do have the Hamiltonian formulation of Zakharov. What are the first conclusions that we can work out of this formulation? Firstly, a computation that was made two centuries ago by Cush. There is a result. Cauchy, in 1815, it's a huge memoir. I think this is his first paper, a memoir of 300 pages long perfectly written in a perfect French style that Cauchy contributed to, to initiate, in a sense. And it is remarkable because he, he, he published his memoir just three years after Fourier introduced his theory. And the theory of, of Fourier was published only in 1822, 10 years after he submitted, I think. But already three years after, Cauchy used Fourier analysis and I think he used Fourier analysis not only for Fourier, for periodic function, but also he proved, in a sense, the Fourier inversion formula for functions which are not periodic. So it's a beautiful work. So, and we can extract these consequences. The linearized water wave equation can be written as follows. dt of eta is equal to modulus of d acting on psi dt psi plus g of eta is equal to zero. Where modulus of dx is a fractional Laplacian, more precisely, this is the square root of minus Laplacian, because for us Laplacian is negative, so minus Laplacian is positive. What does it mean? It means that it is a Fourier multiplier which is defined on the way it acts on oscillating exponential, it multiplies them by the Euclidean norm of the vector psi. So this is a result due to Cauchy. The proof we have the system here, you see that this term is quadratic. We are linearizing at the origin, I mean around 0, 0. So this term is negligible. It remains only to prove that we can approximate g of eta psi by, by g of 0. And in fact, it suffices to prove that g of 0 psi is equal to modulus of dx acting on psi. But when eta is equal to zero, this is the situation where we can compute phi explicitly. And we use Fourier analysis in this way. The problem being invariant by translation in x, not in y, of course, we consider the Fourier transform only with respect to the variable x. We introduce phi hat of xi y, which is the Fourier transform with respect to the variable x. It solves an ordinary differential equation. It 
solve an ordinary differential equation. So, and we did use that the solution has to be of this form. We exclude the solution with the sign minus here because the solution has to go to zero when infinity. Huh? Y goes to minus, not plus, so this is the only admissible solution. Then, of course, g of zero psi, which is dy phi on y equals zero. So you look, you differentiate this with respect to psi. And you get exactly what you want. And there is, in the memoir of Cauchy, there is more. There is more. Cauchy explains, and there are sentences where it is explicitly written, that his linear theory explained for the dispersion of the wave. OK? And this is fundamental. It follows that dt squared of eta plus modulus of dx eta is equal to 0. Now, consider a plane wave. That is a solution of the form epsilon cos cosinus of kx minus omega t. We have a plane wave. We assume that x belongs to r. It is solution if and only if omega squared is equal to g times absolute value of k. Okay? It's an immediate computation. This plan will only if and only omega and k satisfies this relation. And so this is very important because, of course, in mathematics, to understand an equation means to understand the way the equation reduces the number of variables. Okay? Here, this explains how the equation reduces the number of variables. It does this by imposing a relationship between the time scale and the spatial scales. And this is that condition that explains the propagation of the wave. In particular, different harmonics travel at different speed. OK? Different harmonic travel at different speed. You look, this, this harmonic has some speed. You write this as a function of x minus ct, where c is the ratio of omega divided by k, and so on. So this is why you have dispersion. But this dispersion does not explain the shape of the wave. If you look carefully, and at that time people were very good to perform experiments even without so much material, you observe at waves and you will see that they are flat throw and sharp crest. A wave looks something like this, which of course is possible only if a wave contains several harmonics. Otherwise, it will be a pure sinusoid function. And you can see, it was observed by people, that such wave can propagate without change of shape. How is it possible that such a wave composed of different harmonic travel like a group without change of space, like a permanent solution? Because dispersion implies that it is impossible. This harmonic should separate in the end. So this was a paradox that was solved 30 years after Cauchy by Stokes in a paper which is also extraordinarily well written. And what type set? Stokes, Stokes proves this. You understand the solution to this paradox. Sophisticated computations and one idea that is easy to explain on the blackboard. 
the dispersion relationship, the way the equation reduces the number of variables, is more subtle. It also depends on the amplitude, not only on the time scale and the spatial scale, but also on the amplitude of this solution. More precisely, Stokes proved there exist approximate solutions of the form theta of Tx is equal to epsilon times cosine of theta plus epsilon squared over 2 cosine of 2 theta solution of that form where theta is equal to x minus ct, and c is equal to 1 plus epsilon square over 2 times square root of g plus o of epsilon 4. So this is beautiful. You have a dispersion relationship that depends on the amplitude. It is classical for us now. It's well explained, for example, in the book by Witham. But at the time, it was a true discovery. Also, it's only approximate solution. It means that it is only computation. But there are no so easy computation. And in particular, if you look on internet and to try to find the value of this coefficient mu that I have forgotten, or other coefficients, there are, you look on Wikipedia, because this is one of the objects that has been studied the most for Waterway. And the numbers that are given are false on Wikipedia. And they give a reference to a book. You read the book, and there is the first obvious mistake, is that the value given on Wikipedia are not the same as on the book. <laughs> so this is the first mistake. <laughs> but it's not the only one, because in the book, the values are also false. <laughs> OK, that's fun. Uh, if you look at the paper by Stokes, at first you're puzzled, because you think the constants are false, which is impossible. OK? But it's very, it, it took me a lot of time to understand because it's written in a perfect English that I am not able to read, that the vertical is oriented down, downward. So it changed the signs that change the result. And there is another paper if you want to check the computation. This is a paper by Rayleigh. So Rayleigh, this is a great scientist whose computation are necessarily correct because Rayleigh, you remember, he got is the first one who made a computation that explains why the sky is blue. So this is something. And he also got the Nobel Prize because of his discovery with Ramsey of Argon by a careful computation. Very careful computation. So there is a paper by Rayleigh where he computed Stokes wave in four pages. This is simply splendid, extremely well written. So Rayleigh, if you want to find the constant, this is Rayleigh 1911. And you look also at the complete work. Because in the paper by Rayleigh, there are two constant A and alpha that are, and they, it's very di difficult to, to read them as they are typeset. But you look on the complete work that were published at the end of his life, and it is easier to read. And Rayleigh, he also proves this result. For this tox wave, the difference between the kinetic and potential energy, he was able to compute that they are non-zero. So there is no equipartition of energy for Stokes wave. And we, we are going to, to discuss further this result in the third lecture. If you want more references, Stokes wave, Stokes prove only the existence of approximate solution. 
the existence of exact solution in the vicinity in the vicinity of Stokes wave was proved much later by Levitchevita and Nekrasov in 1925. They used methods that I don't uh, remember, but essentially modern proof used bifurcation theory, which is a way to implement the implicit function theorem. So this is you are in the neighborhood of what you understand, the neighborhood of what was understood by Cauchy. Much later, in the beginning of the 80s, Amik, Frankel, and Toland, as well as Plotnikov, proved the existence of large amplitude stocks with epsilon B, so big that you reach solution forming a corner. I mean, this solution where you have a singularity, a Lipschitz singularity. Then, Another notable improvement was, pro was by the series of papers by Jos, Plotnikov, and Solon, who prove it's a beautiful result, the existence of groups that were first studied by Businesk. What is a standing wave? It's a wave of that form. It's close to epsilon of x times cosine of t. So these are waves that oscillate forever. It's very interesting because this is what happens when you send a periodic wave, a Stokes wave, on a wall. The Stokes wave bounces back and interacts with the Stokes wave that is incoming. Superimpose two Stokes waves, one in this direction, one in this one, and you get a standing wave. This is why this solution exists and has been observed in our books. So just Plotikov and Colin did that for the case without suspension. And with Pietro Baldi, we extended this to the case with surface tension. The main difference between Levitchevita and this is that there you have small divisors, so you cannot no longer use the implicit function theorem. You have to use a Nash, a Nash Moser type function theorem. And in particular, for such solution, we are able to prove only the existence of the solution for epsilon very, very small. So it's only part of the solution. This is one possible line of research, if you're interested. To conclude, there is in this corridor some portrait, and there is one of Emil Noter. I don't know if you have noticed. And about other identities that you get using the Hamilton. Once you have a conservation, the fact that the system is Hamiltonian, of course we get that energy is conserved. <coughs> we also get that the mass of the fluid is conserved. If we assume that the mass, not the mass, but um, it's normalized this way, then the average of psi is equal to zero. And eventually, OK? So this can be readily deduced from the fact that the system is Hamiltonian and that the problem is invariant, has some symmetries. Okay, I skip the proof to conclude soon. If you want to study the Cauchy problem now, the formulation by Zakharov, Craig, and Sulem suffer from some difficulty. It was proved by Eyman uh, in 2020 that the problem is quasi-linear. 
the water wave problem is quasi-linear. It's not semi-linear. Exactly this. The flow map that maps the initial data to the solution, and we will see that it exists. The flow map is continuous. You have continuity with respect to the initial data, but it is not C1. So the problem is quasi-linear, so we need to understand how to quasi-linear the problem, quasi-linearize the problem. As an example, let's consider this Hamilton-Jacobi equation. It's a fully nonlinear equation. But if you introduce simply V, which is the derivative of U, you get for V the classical Berger's equation. Okay, so for this Hamiltonian-Jacobi equation, it's easy to quasi-linearize it. You just consider the derivative. For the water wave problem, there is a question about what are the convenient derivatives. Well, there is this uh, proposition that we prove with Nicolas Burke and Claude Zully. We prove that the water wave system is equivalent in a sense which is rigorous. Huh? I mean, it's not like a, okay. We rigorously prove that the water wave system, that starting from Euler, is equivalent to a system of equation for the unknown BV. That, that reads as for dtb plus v dot gradient b is equal to a minus g, where a is a so-called Taylor coefficient. dtb plus v dot gradient v plus a times zeta is equal to zero, where zeta is just the derivative of eta and dt of zeta plus v dot gradient of zeta is equal to g of eta v plus uh, zeta g of eta b. So it's possible to quasi-linearize the water wave equation. And we see here a coefficient that appears, the so-called Taylor coefficient, a. And there is a fundamental fact that was first observed by C. Jui Wu is that this coefficient is positive. The proof is simple. The proof given by David is very simple. Once you are able to introduce a pressure you have to rigorously justify it. Then, you can compute what is the Laplacian of the pressure. Phi being harmonic, this is the Laplacian of this vanishes. Laplacian of this vanishes, it remains only. The Laplacian of the square of the gradient, which is, give you minus the Euclidean norm of the Hessian square. <coughs> and it has a sign. Okay? There is another quantity which has a sign, which is the value of P on the free surface. And a third quantity with the sign is G. G is positive. So this gives you a restriction on the value of P at minus infinity. Then using the maximum principle, okay, of course you need to some details. But just the maximum principle and these third, these three signs, you get that P reaches its minimum on the free surface. But P is equal to zero on the free surface. So it reaches its minimum at every point of the free surface. And then you use the sharp maximum at the point where P reaches its minimum. The normal derivative has a sign, but the normal derivative is related to the vertical derivative because, again, P vanishes on the free surface. So it's easy then to get that this component has a sign. And this is essential if you want to study the Cauchy problem. I will say a few words about that in the third lecture. 
So we have seen that G is positive imply in a sense local well positiveness. You still have local well positiveness for G equals zero. This is a very recent long paper by Siddhant Agrawal. When G is negative, I don't think there are so much results about ill positiveness, but we do have some inequalities that I will explain in the third lecture with Claude Zilli. In the second lecture, I will say more about the Dirichlet-Neumann operator from PD point of view or microlocal analysis. And I will stop there. Thank you very much.